Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for the opportunity that you continue to give us to come together and feast together on your word. I just ask that you would filter out all that which is foolish, seal to our hearts only that which is truth, that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. In this video here, uh, we're going to talk about the reasons or the explanations that unbelievers give to uh, explain away the resurrection. Uh, Matthew chapter 28, our Lord's been crucified, He's been buried, and we see the marvelous revelation that He had risen from the dead. The soldiers who were guarding the tomb uh, had experienced a great earthquake. Uh, the Lord had descended from heaven and rolled the stone back from the door of the tomb, and His countenance was like lightning, His attire white as snow, and... Uh, for fear of him, those guards at the tomb were caused to shake and become as dead men. And it, it seems appropriate to me that we talk about the resurrection of our Lord and, and spend a little bit of time looking at the explanations uh, for the resurrection of Christ that are often given uh, by both unbelievers and believers alike. Uh, there are a tremendous number of attempted explanations for the resurrection of Christ. Without any doubt, Satan doesn't want you to believe it. And a great number of human beings over the years have not believed in a literal, physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. At the heart of every opposition to the resurrection of Christ is the inescapable conclusion that if he did rise from the dead, then there must be a God. I'm not going to attempt to prove that he did. I know he did because God says he did. And the Holy Spirit speaks truth and he speaks truth to our hearts. I do believe that mankind as a whole is afraid that uh, if it could really be proven that Christ rose from the dead, then he would have to admit that there was a God which they would then be accountable to, uh, the God of all glory. I don't believe that there is any possible argument that will convince anybody that Jesus raised from the dead. I think it's the Holy Spirit. You know, we desperately want other people to understand, you know, how smart we are and, and how they ought to agree with us. Folks, you can't argue anybody into believing anything. And that is more than true when it comes to biblical truth. If anybody is going to believe what the Scriptures say, it's going to be by the work of the Holy Spirit, not by how brilliantly you argue. There was a, a time in my life when I thought the greatest thing that a Christian could, could do was be an apologetic. And many believe that if they're skilled in apologetics, they can argue anybody into heaven and that is a stupid statement. It's not only stupid, it's entirely false. And it leads a person away from the simple truth that it's God who died in your place and caused you to be born again. And it's the Holy Spirit who leads you into truth. No one else leads you into truth. I'm thrilled with the fact that our Lord rose from the dead, and I want you to believe it, but I can't argue you into that. So I put together 17 arguments that uh, unbelievers have in dismissing the resurrection. Um, so we're going to look at those. The first one that's uh, quite common is that we don't really know whether he rose from the dead or not because there isn't really enough evidence. You know, there's not enough evidence to substantiate the resurrection of Christ. Now, you can believe that if you want to, but, you know, there just isn't enough evidence for it. Now, once you take that as a presupposed truth, then the argument makes sense. But who says that there isn't enough evidence to establish it? I believe without question that in any court of law, there's enough sufficient evidence to prove beyond any doubt that Christ rose from the dead. You know, if I can parade 500 witnesses through the court uh, 
I don't think there's any court in the land that wouldn't agree that there was sufficient evidence. Another one suggests that we don't just we just don't need a resurrection. You know, it doesn't matter whether Christ rose from the dead or not. It really doesn't matter whether you ever lived. What's really important is do you trust the fact that God's forgiven your sin and that you're going to heaven? You know, that's what's important. You know, do, do people understand the gospel, that God's forgiven your sin? Resurrection is not all that important. And folks, I suggest to you that all that God decreed hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Another one is that people just saw apparitions. You know, they saw what looked like Christ, but, you know, I mean, that looks like Jesus of Nazareth. You know, I know he was cruelly treated, you know, but, 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 but that I saw him. And so people be began to testify that they saw somebody that looked like Jesus. You know, they were sure it was Jesus, and, and that delusion developed into a community of people who professed that Christ rose from the dead. And then that's how the legend began to be spread around. You know, what really happened is that Christ's soul went to heaven and he came back in a spiritual body. He didn't, he didn't rise from the dead. The body's still in the tomb. And what these people saw was a spiritual body that made itself manifest to them. But he didn't really rise from the dead. He's still in the tomb. You know, the body's there and nobody, nobody bothered to go look uh, because they were so happy to see him in his spiritual body. Well, that doesn't jive with a whole bunch of the evidence that we have. Another one is that there are those who suggest that the empty tomb was Mark's invention. Uh, and Matthew, Luke, and John, they, had, they just all copied from Mark. Mark's the only one that invented this, and the others thought it sounded good, so that's what they wrote too. Another is uh, what actually happened really was uh, Christ's body hung on the cross and was eaten by vultures. You know, if that didn't happen, probably the Romans disposed of his body and buried him in a common grave. And the legend got around, Joseph didn't bury him. Uh, that doesn't make any sense to me. It, to me, it's inconceivable that his uh, body hung on the cross and was eaten by birds. And, and we have all of these witnesses. The Gospel of Matthew was written probably within 18 years of the crucifixion. Uh, you know, do you think these people didn't read or couldn't read? You know, were they dumber than than we are? The average person in Jerusalem could speak fluently three languages. Uh, you know, I can barely speak one. These were not dumb people. You know, and just look at the ancient writings that we have. You know, it's an, really an impressive study of the commonality between these people and us today. If the body hung on the cross until the birds had eaten it, there would have been somebody who, who would have written that down. Another one of the arguments is that Christ didn't appear if he, if, uh, he, didn't, he didn't appear uh, if, if he rose from the dead. You know, he didn't appear to certain people. You know, I mean, if Christ rose from the dead, he'd go see Pilate. You know, like, how you doing, Pilate? Remember me? You know, you know, Herod, you wanted to see some miracles. You know, why would he appear to any of his enemies? He didn't die for them. Uh, he didn't die for those who were not his sheep. Why should he care about anybody who wasn't his sheep? Why wouldn't his great concern be to comfort and reveal himself to those who are his? You know, what kind of argument is it to suggest he didn't reveal himself to his enemies? Now, I can't come up with a single reason why he'd want to. They weren't his. He didn't die in their place. That's a, it's a silly argument, and yet it's pr proposed time and time again. Another one is that the resurrection isn't the best possible explanation of an empty tomb. You know, the, there are many others. And then they come up with, uh, with all these other possible explanations which make more sense than a resurrection and I, I can't go over all of those tonight. Uh, another is that it's been suggested that the resurrection of Christ is a Hebrew myth. Uh, just like Jonah 
uh, you know, in the belly of the whale. Everybody knows that's impossible. You know, lots of articles written on that. And the Jews come up with, with uh, you know, with these kinds of myths. And the, and the resurrection of Christ is just one of those. And it made good sense for the Jewish community. Well, first of all, it doesn't make uh, good sense for the Jewish community. And secondly, if, if Paul the Apostle is back preaching the, the resurrection of Christ within two years of the resurrection, you know, a Pharisee of Pharisees, you know, top dog, uh, nobody's education and reputation exceeded that of Saul of Tarsus. You know, well-known Pharisee, known for persecuting Christians, and God sees him on the road to Damascus, couldn't have been more than two or three years, and he's in Jerusalem, not Damascus, uh, preaching the resurrection, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. To me, that's it's inconceivable that it's a myth. Another is Christ didn't die on the cross. That's one of the common ones. He just fainted. You know, he, he wasn't uh, he wasn't on the cross very long. That's we know we do know that. Uh, most people hung on the cross for two or three days. Some for four days. Christ was only there maybe six hours. That's far too short a time. He didn't die. He just fainted. They put him in a tomb. He came back to life after all that torture. Uh, he comes back to life after all of that torture, the whippings, the scourgings, all of the crucif the the pain and the scars, the Every, the wounds from the crucifixion, he comes back to life, moves the stone that bothered several healthy women, you know, staggered out of the tomb and, and inspired his apostles. You know, the, and they all died a martyr death rather than admit it, it was a fake. Uh, tortured, wretched body, shoulders out of joint, blood from the crown of thorns and the nail pierced wounds. You know, and then the disciples went out and preached that he rose from the dead where that they were all martyred. That doesn't make any sense. Another one uh, that's commonly taught is that the women went to the wrong tomb. You know, and those who preach that make a great deal about how emotional women are and how much they cry. And, and they, well, they didn't really know where the tomb was, so they went to the wrong tomb. Well, that surely don't make any sense because if we believe the Scriptures at all, the women were there observing while Nicodemus and Joseph buried the body of Christ, so they knew where it was. They'd seen it buried, so they had to they had to modify the women going to the wrong tomb theory. You know, you could tear that apart, and so they modified it. They modified it. What really happened is Joseph went to Pilate and demanded or requested the body of Christ. It was on the cross. You know, boy, that jives with Scripture. So, so he took it down, and he and Nicodemus carefully buried that body. Then the Roman soldiers came and took that body out of the tomb and they did what they should do according to law. They buried it in a criminal's grave and so the women, you know, when the women came there on the first day of the week, it wasn't there. It isn't that they were so emotional and so confused. You know, they went, they went, they went to the right tomb. What they didn't know was that the Romans had removed that body and buried it as a criminal ought to be buried and that became quite popular. That explains why the women went to the wrong tomb. That, that explains what happened to the body. That explains the fact that when Paul's preaching, you know, uh, you know, you can go, you know, yeah, the tomb's empty. Now, it doesn't really quite explain how they buried the body of Christ, and nobody knew about that, because surely it would have made it into the Jerusalem Post, you know, maybe not in the headlines, but some, some place it would have appeared that they knew where the body was, of all the people in the world who would have liked to prove that the body was still at some burial location, it, it would have been the high priest, the Sanhedrin, the experts, the lawyers, the guys that was really smart, and they got this gospel that's converting the whole world, and the, and and they had to all they had to do is just say here's the body, you know, uh, all they had to do is say here's the body, make it public, uh, make it publicly known that there's the body and there wouldn't have been any Christianity, but they didn't do that. You know, why? I mean, that's what the critics can't answer. Another is, well, then there's the story that the soldiers, they went in and admitted that an angel came down and moved the stone and the body, 
and the tomb was empty and they were as dead men and they didn't know what to do and they were bribed to say that they went to sleep on guard duty. And so they argue over how badly Roman soldiers were treated and they argue about how rough a duty it was to be a Roman soldier and how terribly damning would be the admission that you went to sleep on guard duty, but more than going to sleep on guard duty, uh, that which you were commissioned to guard was gone, uh, and that meant a death sentence. And so they say, you know, no soldier would ever say that. You know, even if it happened, they wouldn't admit it. Yet our scriptures tell us that they were paid money to admit it. Or Matthew didn't really write Matthew. I, you know, I have no doubt that it happened, and if and if it had not happened, you know, this was written when these people are alive. Do you think if you were one of those soldiers and this was written, you know, well, you, that you could argue uh, that nobody read? They didn't know how to read back then. Come on. I mean, we found women's grocery lists written over the top of portions of First Peter. So, so common was First Peter, some woman would write her grocery list on it. Don't get the idea that nobody read or that there wasn't anything written, because there was. Another argument is, is made that, that the disciples, in order to establish their credibility, they needed a resurrection. You know, yeah, yes, they, they had all forsaken him and fled, but many people had heard Christ preach, and many people knew that they were his disciples, and they needed a resurrection, so they, they fostered the story even though it cost them their lives. You know, it was worse to die as a martyr just to convince people that they weren't fools in following Christ. And if you can believe that, more power to you. And then there's others that argue that the resurrection wasn't preached until so long after it happened that there was no longer any need to worry about an empty tomb. And that, of course, is not true. Uh, in not much over two years, Paul was preaching it in Jerusalem where it really happened. And then there's the hallucination theory. You know, that is that people were sort of hypnotized into believing, and the reason that theory makes sense to a lot of people is because only his friends profess to see him. You know, and that seems to lend credibility to this hallucination idea because it seems logical to most people that we... He would have appeared to more than just his disciples and his friends. He, he would want, you know, people to know that he really rose from the dead. And so he'd make it very apparent to lots of other people. He appeared to those who were his followers, and that's sufficient. But there are those who believe that since they're the only ones that saw the risen Christ, then they all hallucinated. Now, we're, we're told in, in 1 Corinthians, uh, written by Paul, and, and I don't see why people deprecate the writings of Paul when they don't, the writings of other historical documents. This is God's Word, it's, and we study it as God's Word, but aside from that, it is without question an historical document. It is not only that, it's, a, it's an historical document with a constant, consistent, unbroken chain of evidence from within 18 years of the death and resurrection of Christ until today. I mean, when the, when the Gutenberg printing press was invented, 90, 98 to 99% of everything printed was either biblical or it was about the Bible. You know, there are copies that we can hold in our hands from the early first century until today. Isn't any other ancient document you can do that with? You know, you have the Dead Sea Scrolls in your lifetime, uh, a Hebrew copy of the Old Testament, which dated 12... 1,300 years after Christ, oldest document we had. Suddenly, we shoved it back almost 2,000 years, and there aren't any significant changes, which is the tremendous testimony to the concern and the accuracy of the Jewish scribes. I don't want to spend too much time pushing this, but this is a, a competent historical document. We have cups and saucers and inscriptions in caves that people take is almost absolute gospel. And here we have writings that we can trace to very close to the time that the events happened. And there's, a, there's an unbroken chain of those evidences.
Dearly beloved, when you have eyewitness accounts of an event and repeated references to that event over centuries, and you set about to substitute another explanation for that event, you are on the losing end of this argument. Can't be done. The resurrection requires the existence of God. If Christ rose from the dead, there's a God. It's that simple. Many people say they believe that there's a God, but, but, but one wonders if they really do. And one of the great problems with that empty tomb is that people are forced to admit that if it happened, you know, atheists admit that if it happened, there must be a God. And they don't believe there's a God. Therefore, it couldn't happen. Another is there are those who believe that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did in fact write their gospel and, and all they were doing was going along with the feelings and the convictions of the time. There was a, there was a resurrection from the dead that's in mythological literature 2,000 years before Christ. You know, Hinduism has a, a resurrection from the dead that predates Christ by over 1,000 years. And there were those things in other religions. So why can't these fairy tales tales, fables, myths be true in what we call Christianity. And so that's one of the arguments, that this is simply carrying on the myth that's characteristic of other religions around the world. And then there's a very prominent conviction that actually all this happened. It all did, except the problem is they got the wrong guy. You know, they just thought that they were crucifying Christ, but they actually crucified Judas so when Christ appeared, no problem. He wasn't crucified and he was there and he really ex excited. He, he really excited his disciples and Christianity began as a lie. In fact, it's been said that Christianity is in a real mess because it was a lie. Oh, it's helped a lot of people, but we now need another noble lie, you know, like, like the resurrection of Christ. And they go on and on about all the good that it did, hospitals, colleges, people's lives transformed, sinners become good people. All this is good, but it all came about because of a lie. We need another lie. We need another one like that. That's kind of what interests me, you know, because the lie of the resurrection of Christ is beginning to fizzle out. Its, its influence and its, its effects are dying out and people are leaving churches by the droves you know, we need another cleverly devised fable. Something to, you know, the, we, need to, we just need another one. What a ridiculous thing to say that, that all of the events of Christianity, the marvel of what Christ did for us, was all based on a lie. And yet the Muslims today, they believe that Ju Judas was crucified in Christ's place and that Christ really didn't rise from the dead. And then there's the last one on my list. This, I think, makes 17 that I, I came up with here. The last one. That the one who died on the cross wasn't the true Messiah, but a false one. That's Israel. That's Israel today. You know, I, I, we can spend hours pointing out why it is not, it's not reasonable to accept any one you know, of these. There's nothing wrong with a historical document called Matthew. We can date it. We know something about the author. We have no reason to doubt what he said. What we do know is, is that what he wrote cost him his life. That's at least a good reason to believe that he was really convinced that what he wrote was truth. There's not a single reason we should believe that Matthew copied from Mark or that Mark was the only one who really wrote about a resurrection from, from the dead. And and all the other Gospels decided to back him up, isn't any reason to believe that, that there are four different people writing from four different perspectives. They're, they're all good, solid historical documents that are supported by evidence down through the centuries. They've been accepted by, by multiple organizations that have been copied and copied and copied. You know, we can trace their origin back to within a few years of the events which they mentioned. Uh, Christians don't seem to realize that there's nothing wrong with this historical document because it is God-breathed. It's been said that there's more evidence that Christ rose from the dead than there is that Abraham Lincoln was shot or that George Washington was ever president of the United States. 
I declare to you that our Lord did in fact rise from the dead and that when He did, we rose with Him to walk in newness of life, His life. That takes me to the end of this video, to the primary verse that I wanted to set before you or to remind you of. We saw this as we went through our study through the epistle of Romans. It's Romans chapter 4, verse 25. And we're going to look at that real quickly here. Because I suggest to you that we are now living through a time that's unprecedented in all of human history. Or that history is being erased before our very eyes. And that if the Lord tarries, we may find ourselves continuing to fan a flame that's growing dimmer by the second as far as the world around us is concerned. Folks, Romans 4.25. He was delivered up for our transgressions. He was raised for our justification. The word for there, which you see in many of the translations, is the word dia. In the Greek, it means primarily, it means, it means because, because, or on the account of, is what the word primarily means. Now, the King James, which is everyone's seemingly everyone's favorite, says uses the word for. Many of the translations and good ones use the word because. I believe that is the word. It's the, it's the, it's the very specific definition of the word. So he was delivered because of our transgressions. And he was raised up because of our justification being made righteous you got to look at it just at face value just for what it is okay you have christ's death he was delivered up because of our offenses our transgressions his death was sufficient as far as the father was concerned the father was propitiated fully satisfied with what christ did on our behalf and and because he was because God was propitiated and God saw that his work was sufficient we were made righteous and because we were then made righteous you got to follow this in order Christ was raised Christ was raised from the dead because of our being made righteous. But the many translations that use the word for tend to be misleading because it, it leaves it sort of op an open question as to whether or not, you know, we as believers will be made righteous or we will be made justified. It's kind of a sort of, a, the word for implies this possibility. It's just only possible, you know, when the actual text says it's certain. What I, what I really am trying to impress upon you here is, is that if you were not, if you and I had not been made righteous by the perfect finished work of Christ, which, uh, which God was fully satisfied with, Christ wouldn't have been raised. The very, when you go to speak about or talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which everything hangs on, please, please stop and consider the ramifications of Romans 4.25. It was because you were made righteous, you and I were made righteous, justified. The word is acquitted, okay? God was fully satisfied with what Christ did. And, and we were made righteous by His death. And as a result, Christ was raised from the dead. He, he could not have been raised from the dead if the Father had not been fully satisfied with what Christ did on our behalf. And most Christians that you meet today are just totally oblivious to the fact that they, they stand before God righteous, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.